Hi everyone, welcome to our PowerPoint about the tort of negligence. We've already been talking about intentional torts. Negligence is really different because negligence is what we often think of as torts that happened by accident. You know, the classic slip and fall. Nobody meant to put a banana peel on the ground for someone to fall at the grocery store, but nevertheless, somebody slipped on a banana peel and now wants to sue the store for their injuries. That's really what we talk about with the word negligent somebody acting negligently. And maybe, maybe you've heard that term before, but in this PowerPoint, we're going to break down the elements of negligence so that we can understand legally what it means for a defendant to be liable for their negligence. Because if you think about it, just because somebody slips on a banana peel at a grocery store doesn't mean they automatically win a lawsuit against the grocery store. But the other, on the other hand, nor does it mean that the grocery store can just turn to that patron and say, oh, this was all your fault. We don't have to pay for your damages at all. It's really somewhere in the middle, and that is the tort of negligence. So really, in short, what is negligence? It is a tort law that allows for one party to recover damages based on the wrongful acts of the other. In my example, it would be the grocery store and its employees failing to do a good job of cleaning the floor and leading to someone being injured. When we talk about the tort of negligence, it's really important to go through the elements. Here is your four-part negligence checklist that you should apply to any negligence problem. First, the court asks, did this particular defendant have a duty of care? Second, did the defendant breach the duty of care, meaning not live up to its obligations? Number three, did the defendant's breach cause harm, was the causation, and of course, did the plaintiff suffer harm or injury? If you're looking at that word duty of care and thinking to yourself, this sounds familiar, it should. We talked about duty of care back in unit four when you read Costa versus Red Sox. That was a classic negligence case. What kind of duty of care did the Red Sox owe that patron? So let's break down these elements a little bit more. Speaking of element of duty, everybody has legal obligations under the law. Everyone's under a duty to not injure others. For example, the last time you got in your car and drove around, you had a duty of care to be a safe driver on the road. A business like Middlesex Community College has a duty to keep the premises reasonably safe for people visiting, right? We don't want, we want the elevators to work. We want stairwells to be clean. That's the duty of care that we all owe. And as we just said with these examples, businesses owe duties of care as well. Grocery stores owe, duty, owe a duty of care and even the Red Sox. But that's only the first element. So when we talk about these elements, what we mean is, what does a plaintiff have to prove to prove a case of negligence? And element number one is a duty of care. The second element is breaching the duty. Breaching the duty means not living up to your obligations under the law. You fell short of what you were supposed to do. Here's a nice textbook definition. Failing to act as a reasonably prudent person would under the circumstances. Think about that from the perspective of a store owner, like a grocery store. If you own the store, and we can talk about you as the owner or your employees, and you're walking down the aisle and all of a sudden you see a banana peel on the floor or something else spilled, what would be the reasonable thing to do? Well, probably clean it up, put a sign there to not step on it, maybe take your cell phone or your walkie talkie to radio someone else in the store to come with a mop and a sign. These are all reasonable steps. So what we mean by breaching a duty of care is that someone didn't do that. Maybe the store employee saw the spill and just decided I'm too busy to do it or I'll get to it later because I'm so busy. Yeah, maybe that was not so reasonable. I gave you other examples too here of driving, like running a red light. Not so reasonable to run a red light. That's breaching your duty of care of being a reasonable, safe driver. What about medical malpractice? If you haven't heard this term before, it's lawsuits against the medical profession for injuries that individuals suffer. Medical malpractice lawsuits are also rooted in negligence. That's basically a plaintiff saying, I was injured by my doctor, like let's say during a surgery or a surgical procedure. And the argument says first that the defendant doctor owes a duty of care to that plaintiff, which he does to act as a reasonably safe doctor performing the medical procedure, whatever it is. And if the doctor allegedly, of course, does not live up to his or her standard of care and injures the plaintiff, 
that's breaching a duty of care to the patient. And that's what the medical malpractice lawsuit would be rooted in. So those are the first two elements. We must have first establish a duty of care and second, a breach of the duty. What about the next two elements, causation and harm? Causation often sounds like the easiest element, doesn't it? We have to link the defendant's conduct with the injury. So a really easy example would be, if I see the banana peel on the grocery store, maybe I don't see it, I'm in the grocery store, I'm walking by, I don't see the banana peel, I slip, I fall, but I'm not really hurt, I'm just a little embarrassed, and I get back up, and I walk out of the grocery store, and I get into the car, and I get into a car accident on the ride home. Well, did the slip and fall, did the banana peel cause my injuries? Probably not, right? So you have to be able to link the injury to the actual conduct, the breaching conduct of the defendant. There has to be a causal relationship. So that brings me to these two important points about causation. There's two types of causation, actual causation and proximate causation. Actual causation is what we call the but-for test. This is kind of like linking dominoes where you take you know, every single turn of event, and if you can connect them, that's causation. For example, Meg owns a convenience store. She sees a jar of jam crash and spill, but she doesn't clean it because she's too busy playing on her iPad. Her customer, Tim, he comes in and he slips on the jam. But for Meg's failure to reasonably clean the jam, would Tim have been injured? Of course not. So we can hold Meg liable because we can say that causation was present here. We can link the dominoes. The jam spilled, Meg didn't clean it up, and Tim got injured. That's the easiest way to establish causation. But not all, not all causation works so easily. Let's talk about a more complicated question. We also have to talk about something called proximate cause. Here's a great example. Tim and Meg are driving separate cars. Meg runs a red light and she crashes into Tim right? That sounds like negligence. We just used that example. They both exit their vehicles to exchange insurance information. All of a sudden, a bolt of lightning appears out of the sky, strikes Tim, and he dies. Is Meg liable? Has Meg, is Meg's negligence the causation of Tim's death? Let's go through this. Think about the but-for causation. But-for Meg running the red light Tim would not have had to stop his car and exchange insurance information, right? We can link the dominoes here. So actual causation is present here. Meg is the actual cause of Tim's death. But does anybody think that's a little far-fetched? That the fact that she ran a red light and he just happened to randomly be struck by a bolt of lightning? In this type of case, we bring it back to this word called foreseeability. For proximate cause, we say, listen, of course there could be actual causation, but what we really want to think about with negligence is what type of harms were foreseeable. Foreseeable harms when there's been a car accident like this might be that Tim gets injured on the side of the road or something like that is foreseeable. The bolt of lightning, not so foreseeable. And this is the concept of proximate cause. A defendant is only liable when the injury was foreseeable. I want to mention a fun little famous case that gave us this principle of proximate causation called Paul's graph versus Long Island Railroad. This is a true case. What happened in this case was a train was coming into a station and at one end of the train platform, a woman was standing next to this very large clock tower and she was waiting for her train. A train comes into the station and starts to pull away. That's not her train. And it turns out that there's a gentleman who wants to get on the train that is moving. So he is running to get on the train. I actually don't think people would do this today, but they did in the 1920s. And he's running to the train and he happens to be holding a bag with him. Nobody knows what's in the bag. He goes to get on the train. He's trying to jump on the train. And the, the uh, engineer, the conductor, I guess, is trying to be really helpful and pulls the guy onto the train. And as he does so, the bag that he is holding falls out of his hands. And what do you think happens? I bet you can't guess because it was not foreseeable. The bag happened to have been holding explosives. And the explosives went off, causing a rattle at the train station. Remember that woman I mentioned at the beginning standing by the clock tower? 
the rattle led the clock tower to fall on her and injure her. Sounds like a crazy case, right? But it's true. And so it was a case involving the negligence of the railroad company of lifting this guy onto the train, which then, of course, if you connect the dominoes, led directly to the clock, the, the falling of the bag, the explosives going off, the clock tower falling and injuring her. But let's be honest here. Was that an injury that was foreseeable? The court said no. And the court in Paul's Grab versus Long Island Railroad established this principle of proximate cause. So even though causation seems like it might be the easiest of the elements, it has some complicating factors to it as well. Okay, so we've talked about duty, breach, causation. The last element, of course, is harm. A plaintiff must prove that he has been harmed. Remember the example with my banana peel that I just got back up afterwards? If I get back up afterwards, maybe I'm a little bit embarrassed, nothing big, I haven't been harmed. So really, there's no lawsuit there. What kind of harms are we talking about, though? Clearly, we're talking about physical harms. People can be hurt physically by tort conduct, but also financial harms. That could include time off of work to go see a doctor or spend time in a hospital. It might also include financial harms, like, well, including the lost wages, maybe lost vacation and sick time. But also, what about medical bills? A tort plaintiff who can prove duty, breach, causation, and harm can also show harm of a financial nature. What about emotional damages? That's a much tougher question, but there is something called pain and suffering that I might have nightmares after a tort case. Maybe I had, I've been the victim of a medical malpractice lawsuit or medical malpractice, and I now suffer from some anxiety or nightmares as a result of the negligence. Those are harms as well. So we went through the elements, duty, breach, causation, and harm. And that is the four-part checklist in order to prove a negligence case.